What up, Cavs Nation? I'm your host, Ethan Sands, and I'm back with another episode of the Wine and Gold Talk podcast. Coming to you after the Lakers Cavs game, where the Cavs came away with their fifth win of the season. They are perfect to start the year. It's their best start to a season since 2016, but nobody really cares, and especially not the Cavs players. They're only looking ahead and trying to continue the streak. I know we're going to cover the bigger storylines, Chris, from tonight a little bit later, so I wanted to start with the Cavs. This is the third game that they've scored 130 points or more this season already. Last year, they only had four such games. What have you liked about the Cavs offense to start the season? I just think it's more creative. I think it's more dynamic, and I just don't think it's as predictable. They've got a lot of different ways that they can attack a defense, and I think that was part of the plan um, when going with Kenny Atkinson, is going away from a pick-and-roll heavy approach. And Kenny has talked about this a number of times, Ethan. Um, You can't completely go away from the pick-and-roll in today's NBA, especially when you have the likes of Darius Garland, Donovan Mitchell, and Jared Allen. But can you do other things um, throughout the course of games on the offensive end of the floor so that when that is taken away, when teams are game planning and strategizing um, to make it difficult for you to run that stuff that you want to do, what are your counters? What are your answers for that? And, and I just feel like Kenny Atkinson is the kind of basketball mind that has answers. When defenses have answers, he has his own answers And the Cavs have enough different places that they can go to offensively, in part because Evan Mobley has evolved as a player, because he's more comfortable out on the perimeter, because he's more comfortable as a pick and roll ball handler, because he's more comfortable attacking defenders off the dribble and playing out of the pocket and and playing in space and getting the ball on the move. And Donovan Mitchell has empowered Evan Mobley, and he's making it easier on him to be that kind of player. So that to me, is the thing that stands out. You know, so many times the Cavs went through games last year, Ethan, and like the box score was almost similar game to game to game. Donovan Mitchell was the leading scorer. Jared Allen had a double dub. Uh, Darius Garland was kind of all over the place. So forget him. Evan Mobley was between like 15 and 22 ish points or 14 and 22 ish points. But the nights that it was somebody other than Donovan Mitchell, that was rare for the Cavs. And Donovan has willingly taken a step back so that this team, and Evan Mobley specifically, can take a step forward. Um, The guy who leads the team in touches per game is not Donovan Mitchell. It's not Darius Garland. It's not Jared Allen. It's Evan Mobley, the fourth year forward. Um, And I think that's a big deal. And I think um, it makes it more difficult for a defense when they don't know exactly what the Cavs want to do offensively and they don't know exactly who they're going to go to offensively. It's, It's just more of a democratic approach. First quarter was Donovan Mitchell. Fourth quarter was, you know, Evan Mobley. Sprinkled throughout the game was a little bit of Karis LeVert and certainly Jared Allen as dominant as he was. And and I just think the balance that they have, the depth that they have, and the democratic approach uh, makes this offense what it is. I completely agree. And that's kind of where I was going to go, right? This this offense has seen so much chemistry built out, right? That is what we talked about coming into this season. The continuity, the continuation of the players that are along on this team makes it flow quicker and has allowed them to get into their offensive sets in a new system quicker than many would have expected. Even Kenny Atkinson said after the game, he didn't expect it to be this good this quickly, right? Because You expect for guys to have a transition period and all these different things. But having this group together in their third season with Donovan Mitchell has already created opportunities for them to showcase that they can mix and match lineups throughout the game and throughout the season, right? And for me, you mentioned it, right? How the game kind of twisted and turned when it came to who was at the spotlight and maybe even for my anime anime fans, Who was the shadow Hokage, right? Donovan Mitchell jumped out to 15 points in the first quarter, and Karis LeVert 
also had all of his six assists in that period, right? Mm -hmm. Those coincide. Karis LeVert had 11 of his 16 points in the third quarter, while Darius Garland had seven of his 10 assists to start the second half. And then, as you mentioned, Evan Mobley had the best quarter of his career to close out the game with 17 points in the fourth. And one thing for sure, Chris, I don't care if the refs did it by calling five fouls that seemed rather soft or if he simply had or wanted to show his tenacity in the few minutes that he had. But Evan Mobley was playing with a different level of tenacity in the final frame. And I wouldn't want to make him mad if I was an opposing defense, if it, if it was up to me, especially with his newfound aggression at the offensive end. I think Evan has played with that level of aggressiveness all year. And I think you can see it because, because I think he's more confident and I think he feels empowered. Um, there's a story that I'm working on in terms of like just this grand plan for Evan Mobley. And, and one of the things that he told me the other day when him and I sat down and had a conversation um, at Madison square garden following shoot around ahead of the Knicks showdown, was just that he feels empowered by his teammates. He understands that they um, believe in him at the highest level, and they're looking to him to become like the franchise. That's a lot of pressure, obviously. That's a lot of responsibility, obviously. But he feels ready to do that. Um, I, I don't think that the Cavs are at that point yet. I don't think Evan is at that point yet, but he's on that trajectory. Um, and, and I think when you have that belief coming, and it's also very, very intentional that Donovan Mitchell and Evan Mobley basically share the floor together the entire game. Um, but when you have a superstar player like Donovan, um, somebody who has accomplished as much as he has throughout the course of his career, willingly taking a step back so that another guy can step forward for somebody like Evan, that's meaningful. Having that kind of confidence coming from Donovan is meaningful to Evan. And I, I think he understands his importance to this team. I think he understands how much of this season and how much of the ceiling of this team, Ethan, is tied to him. That's one thing that I've gotten the sense of in talking to Evan um, over the last couple of weeks is that he does. He does understand how important he is to this team. And he does believe that one day um, he can be the face of this franchise. He can be the one that takes them to the level that they're trying to get to. And he's playing like that, right? There isn't hesitation in his game. There's more decisiveness. I think he's more comfortable in this offense. I think he's more comfortable in this system. And... Um, I think he's playing like a guy who uh, has has worked his his tail off over the last couple of years um, to evolve his offensive game to this kind of point. Because if you think about it, like when Evan came into the NBA as the third overall pick, he had a vision for himself. He wasn't going to shortcut the process. He wasn't going to skip steps, but he had a vision for himself. And, and this was always part of the plan to evolve into this kind of offensive weapon with this versatility, with this kind of usage. And he's getting that opportunity to do that. And I think because he's been given that opportunity and he's been empowered by both the coaching staff, this front office and his teammates, um, he, he is playing with a different level of confidence and a different level of aggressiveness. And Chris, it's crazy to think about, right? And for Cavs fans, I want you to sit back and think about this, right? Anthony Davis was supposed to take over the reins of the Los Angeles Lakers in his eighth or ninth season alongside LeBron James, who wanted to hand over the reins to him, right? right. Evan Mobley, in his fourth season, has been claimed or noted to be one of the most pivotal players for this franchise that already mm -hmm. has a franchise face in Donovan Mitchell, yeah. right? This, in his fourth season, he's been asked to do a lot. He's been asked to grow a lot. And Anthony Davis 
now in his in later into his career is finally taking the reins from LeBron James. We saw that to start the season. We saw that a little bit to start the game today before LeBron James had to take over because AD got a little bit injured, whatever. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But Evan Mobley is not only not running from the competition, he is accepting the new role, the new found responsibility that comes along with being a cornerstone of this team and saying, in this new offense, you are important enough to take this team to the next level. And for him to do that in year four, obviously is a huge step in the direction of his uh, growth, but also talking about how he can impact this team this year alongside Donovan Mitchell. Yeah, and here's the other thing, Ethan. I mean, Evan, ever since he stepped onto the floor, he has impacted winning in a positive way. Um, Gotten them in part to the play-in tournament. So, like, every single season that, that he's been in the NBA, he's had a taste of postseason basketball or a taste of success. Um, so I think his game just translates to that. I think he finds ways um, to impact winning. Whatever is needed from him on the nightly basis, he'll find a way to do that at the highest level. And sometimes it's going to be scoring 25 points. Sometimes it's going to be, you know, being more of a defensive anchor and a rim protector. Um, I think what he's showing this year is that um, he can, he can dominate games potentially on the offensive end moving forward, the same way that he has dominated games defensively in the past, you know, you're seeing signs of that guy coming. And I think that's really, really important for the Cavs to have somebody else um, that they can rely on, somebody else that they can go to, somebody else that they can run their offense through other than Donovan Mitchell and have that be a successful formula for the team. Because it's one thing if, if you're somebody like Evan and you were in a situation like the Detroit Pistons, like Cade Cunningham. Right. Or if you were in a situation like Jalen Green in the Houston Rockets, you're getting all these touches, you're getting all these opportunities. But are you really developing championship habits or are you just, you know, putting up numbers? Um, is that really a successful formula? You putting up a whole bunch of points and taking a whole bunch of shots. You know what I mean? Um, but for Evan, I think the thing that he is seeing is that him being this heavily involved offensively, taking this many shots, getting this many sh- touches, that is a successful formula for the Cavs on the offensive end. And I want to circle back to this point that we made a little bit earlier, right? Having players still be able to step in even when guys like Donovan Mitchell or Evan Mobley are having an off night, right? Majority of this game, Donovan or Evan Mobley was on the bench, right? Yeah. Because he was in foul trouble. Same thing with Darius Garland, right? And the Cavs relied on two major pieces to fill those gaps. One, Karis LeVert. I want to go into him a little bit more in depth, but I'm going to touch on the second one. Jared Allen, right? Jared Allen, who has been the quiet force, someone we talked about in the last podcast, and he had 20 points and 17 rebounds, three of those rebounds coming on the offensive end, right? The Cavs overall had six offensive rebounds. <laughs> the Lakers had five, right? So Jared Allen nearly had the same amount, and for most of the game, had more than the entire Lakers team in offensive rebounds. So the toughness, the strategic rebounding, all those different things Jared Allen brought to light. But Karis LeVert had to jump into a interesting role with Darius Garland picking up two fouls in the first three minutes of the game, right? Karis LeVert had to jump in and be something that he's usually not, but a facilitator. We talked about it earlier, six assists in the first quarter. Then he turned to his page and became a scorer when they needed him with the second unit and needed a little bit more boost in the third quarter alongside Darius Garland. Chris, the six-man conversation has happened a lot. We talked about the potential with Kenny Atkinson saying that he could start Karis, I think Karis LeVert is so enjoyable to watch in the six-man role 
one. And two, he's comfortable in that position, something that he's talked about even when J.B. Bickerstaff was coaching and had him in that role the last couple of seasons because not only he got more time with this group, as he said, post game, but Kenny Atkinson, <laughs> when Max Drews went down, made a text message directly to Karis LeVert almost as soon as it happened saying, all right, it's time. You might have to do it all, right, when it comes to starting, when it comes to playing, coming off the bench, being a six man, when it comes to scoring, when it comes to passing, rebounding, defense, something that he's harped on a lot since he came from Brooklyn because of how much stronger he's been, how much more muscle he's put on, 10, 14 pounds, I believe it was, since his uh, NBA draft profile. Chris, what is the development of Karis LeVert, not only the player, but how he's been able to switch his roles on a dime throughout a game impacted this team? I think that's just part of who he is. You know, a couple of years ago, there were people inside this organization that were referring to him as the chameleon because he could just adapt to any situation um, at any point in the game. You want me to be the primary ball handler and distributor? Cool, I can do that. You want me to be a score first guy off the bench to give you a punch? All right, I can do that. You want me to lock down whoever is the uh, best perimeter uh, player on the opposing team? All right, I'll take on that role too. Um, you want me to be a secondary playmaker as opposed to a primary playmaker? All right, I can do that too. And I think that's one of the benefits of somebody like Karras. It's, it's a luxury for this team to have a starter quality guy who um, likes the role of coming off the bench, who has accepted the role of coming off the bench and is incredibly comfortable in that particular role. It almost suits his game. Um, and, and I think it certainly helps uh, to take him away from both Darius Garland and Donovan Mitchell and, and limit the amount of time that he's out there on the floor with those guys because it gets a little bit too ball dominant. It gets a little bit too dribble happy. It gets a little bit too hijack possession-y. Um, so I think he's in the right role. And, and, and I think part of his evolution as a player, Ethan, is accepting that, is accepting that this is probably the best role for him and this is where he can probably make the biggest impact on a winning basketball team. And that's all he wants to do. He just wants to win. He just wants to impact winning. He just wants to do whatever it is that the team needs uh, on that given night or throughout the course of a season. And I think he understands, um, based on how this team is constructed and based on what else is in the starting lineup, that the best way that he can impact this team is coming off the bench and stabilizing the second unit. I think it's a great thing for somebody like Kenny Atkinson um, to have somebody who has been as reliable as Karras. And, and that doesn't mean productivity all the time. Um, a couple of games ago, he only had five points. You know, a couple of games before that, he only had nine. But the energy is going to be there. Um, the, the competitiveness is going to be there. Um, the stability that he brings and the steadiness that he brings to the second unit, that's going to be there. And the skill set that he has is certainly a valuable one on this team where, you know, he can play make off the dribble. He can knock down threes. He can play with or without the ball. Um, and, and I just think, you know, Kenny Atkinson has talked about it a number of different times, Ethan, the, the more playmakers that you can have on the roster the better it is. It's not a hindrance. Um, and the Cavs are going to continue to take advantage of the fact that they have multiple guys that can go out there on a nightly basis and and make plays in that kind of way. Karis LeVert tonight, six assists. Yeah, and that's something that he's been known for, right? He did it a couple of times last season. I think that he went on a stretch where he had seven assists in multiple games, right? Like, so this isn't new. It's just adapting to a new system and still having the same kind of output. That's what I've been taking note from about Karis LeVert. And I like that nickname, the chameleon. I could get behind <laughs> that one. I, get, I think I could get behind that one. You know, the other thing, Ethan, is he's playing within himself. Um, there have been times in the past where, where, where Karis loses his mind a little bit. And he gets a little bit wild. And like I said, he has a tendency in the past to hijack possessions and start trying to do a little bit too much on his own. 
And I feel like he's playing within himself this year. Um, he's only taken two threes a night as opposed to five last year. Um, he's only taking between like eight to 12 shots as opposed to, you know, double digits basically on a nightly basis. Tonight, it was an efficient eight shots to get 16 points. And he made four threes. So like, if he doesn't have to be a volume scorer for this team or a high touch, high usage guy, and he can still be effective and he can still score the ball, that is a big, big deal. And if he can play within himself, that is a big deal as well. And and I feel like he has done that. It's early. Everything that we're talking about tonight comes with the qualifier. It's early. It's only five games in. But there are a lot of promising signs for the Caps. And I I want to get this out of the way, Chris, before we get into our next topic. I think Karis LeVert might have got that craziness out of him when they were trying to figure out the offense during the preseason, right? We saw a couple times he would barrel down on fast breaks, go 3v1, and still try and lay the ball up against defenders, right? Sometimes that's cool. Okay, you you think you're the best uh, scorer on the court. Go do your thing. But let's leave that in the preseason and, and continue doing what you're doing now in the regular season and helping the team win. That That's exactly the change of demeanor that I think the Cavs needed. And I, I think it's good that he got it out of his system at this point or to this point. But And for bigger picture, when it comes to Karras, um, look, if he continues to play like this, this is something that he knows. If he continues to play like this, if he continues to make a positive impact, then he's not going to be a trade candidate at the deadline, right? Because his his greatest value to this team will be what he brings on the floor. And if he continues to be a guy whose greatest value is what he brings on the floor, as opposed to what's on a piece of paper, his contract, an expiring contract, then it allows him to stay here. And this is ultimately where he wants to be. He has said that multiple times. There's a reason why he re-signed. He wants to chase a championship. And this gives him an opportunity to do that. So there is a benefit to him playing this kind of way, uh, playing with this level of consistent effort and and consistent in terms of um, just what he gives to the coaching staff and to the team on a nightly basis, because you know, so much of the conversation coming into this year for the Cavs, Ethan, was about the changes that they didn't make this offseason. And, you know, if things don't go well in the first portion of the season, then the Cavs have the trade deadline to make decisions on how they want to improve this roster or how they want to reconfigure this roster. And the first name that comes up is either Darius Garland or Jared Allen. And then the second name that comes up is Karis Lever because of his contract situation. So... He has plenty of incentive um, to to continue playing the way that he has in the first uh, week and a half of this season. And the final caveat, since we're doing ifs, since we're doing ifs, Chris, six man of the year, something that Donovan Mitchell has praised him and said that he could be in the conversation of. That's dating back to last year. If he continues to do what he does this year, it could be in the conversation. But before Chris yells at me, I'm going to move on, Okay. On to the next topic. Five, and we're already talking end of season award races. Well, <laughs> that's All the right. world that we live in these days. It happens. It happens. All right. Now over to the biggest storyline of the night. LeBron James, Bronny James, being in the building. Obviously, LeBron said he has been playing sick the last couple of games and even said post game tonight that he wasn't at his best. But still, somehow, as Chris said the other night, he does things that are not human. He dropped 26 <laughs> points, something only few people can do, even in a regular game, not mentioning being under the weather and not feeling like yourself. But I still feel like the Cavs defense... And he wasn't feeling like himself either, Ethan. You know how I know that? He told Because you. in the locker room, um, there was post-game Swenson's. That's always the, the Lakers' uh, post-game meal of choice when they come to Cleveland because of LeBron and how much he loves Swenson's. Um, and, and he usually eats the same thing every time he comes back to Cleveland. And it's his galley boy, it's the onion rings or whatever. Swen- I think Swenson's might have a different name for them as opposed to onion rings. Um, and then he always has a banana milkshake. So 
he's sitting at his locker and I look over at him and he is scarfing this burger from Swenson's. He is refueling. Even his his personal trainer, Mike Mancinas, was joking about how fast he was eating that. And I said, hey, man, how you feeling? How's it going? He said, I feel good now. I've got my Swenson's. And I said, where's your banana milkshake? Because that's his go-to. He said, no, Chris, not tonight. I'm not feeling up to, to having that kind of that that kind of enhancer with, with my meal. Um, because he did not think, like, milky substance was going to be a good thing based on the way that he was feeling. So when LeBron bypasses a post-game banana milkshake, you know that he is not feeling his best. I'm glad that that's, that's the bar. But I, <laughs> thank you for that tidbit. I know the listeners are going to love that one. And I checked rather quickly the Swenson's menu. It is just regular onion onion. Rings. Okay, they all right. Have they do have potato tweezers or something of that nature. Ah, that's what it is. Potato yeah. tweezers. I knew it was something <laughs> that they say different. Okay, something great. weird. Something weird. But although LeBron still was LeBron, had 26 points, even though he wasn't feeling well, I still feel like the Cavs defense was swarming tonight. I forget what they called it last year. Was it suffocating? Right? Yeah, suffocates. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and the help defense tonight was quick and direct, and they weren't allowing anything easy to LeBron. I I mean, obviously, you're not going to stop him as he's literally a train on a track in a fast break. But he had (laughs) six turnovers himself, and the Cavs forced 21 turnovers, which turned into 31 points on the other end. Chris, how do you think – we talked a lot about the the offense. We've talked a lot about the offense of the Cavs. How do you think the Cavs' defense is playing as – especially as that's been their defensive identity and harped on constantly by Kenny Atkinson, that they want to keep it that way. Defense has been great. Um, They've maintained the defensive integrity, despite the fact that they've taken a jump offensively, which was the hope all along. Can we get to the offense um, a little bit quicker? Can we make better decisions? Can we make it more creative and more versatile? Can we um, use more modern philosophies? And can we do all of that while maintaining a great defense? Because like the thing that we talked about coming in this year, Ethan, is what does it look like for the Cavs if the defense starts to take a step back? Doesn't seem like that's something that we're going to have to worry about. Again, five games in, no overreaction. But look, in the first five games, Their worst defensive rating, their worst one, is a 108. Think about that. They have had multiple defensive performances that harken back to the year that they had the best defense in the NBA. And I think what it shows you is, you know, when you have Jared Allen and you have Evan Mobley and they erase a whole bunch of mistakes, um... And when you have those guys protecting the other guys out there on the perimeter, that makes your defense immediately. That makes your defense special immediately. That makes your defense unique. And and by the way, um, to put it in perspective for those people that don't necessarily know what the significance of a 108 defensive rating is and and why I stress that so much, uh, That was the number one defense in the NBA last year. The Minnesota Timberwolves were the top defense in the NBA, and their defensive rating was 108.4. So that has been the worst defensive performance that the Cavs have had all year. That was against the Washington Wizards, believe it or not. But, you know, when you have Jared and Evan, that, that is a great foundation. That's a great place to start. And I think Dean Wade entering the starting lineup has been a big, big help. Um, he has done a great job uh, just bothering opponents and being physical and finishing possessions with defensive rebounds um, and, and just doing the things that, that make Dean Wade such an asset for this team. Uh, the difference between Dean Wade as an isolation defender or Dean Wade as a team defender versus Max Struess, there's a difference there. Dean is in the upper echelon um, in a lot of statistical categories that point to defensive impact, and Max Struess just isn't on that same level. Um, So I think he has been 
um, a, a really good addition to this starting group. I think it allows Donovan Mitchell to not have to take those assignments. Darius Garland not have to take those assignments. You know, Dean can guard one through five, basically. It allows them to switch three through five um, and be confident in their ability to switch three through five. And it allows you to do different things schematically when you have three guys out there that are six foot nine or taller that can switch and defend all three front court positions. So those things combined with, you know, the fact that there's been an attention to detail on defense and a point of emphasis to not allow slippage at that end of the floor and maintain that as the identity of this basketball team. I think you cluster those things together and you have what, what you've seen to this point, um, a team that looks capable once again of being a top five defense in the NBA. Defense to offense, Chris. Defense to offense, man. That's what they've been doing, taking early running gun threes uh, in the early parts of the shot clock. Donovan Mitchell talked about potentially a lot of their shots came within 11 seconds of the shot clock uh, in tonight's game. But I think, <laughs> obviously, we've talked about five a lot on this podcast and made me think of five fingers to the face. Sorry, no copyright. out. I don't have... <laughs> the music for that our podcast <laughs> Spotify and, and YouTube but looking at the defensive numbers of this team right you mentioned Dean Wade Dean Wade had three steals tonight also Donovan Mitchell had three steals tonight Darius Garland again had two steals tonight it's felt like at least one of these guys in the starting lineup either has three or more steals to start the season Right? Five fingers to the face, Chris. That, that's the mm-hmm. reference. And then mm-hmm. Jared Allen <laughs> having two blocks, that and one of them a huge rejection at the rim. That's what you really call five fingers to the face. But <laughs> <laughs> I want to get to our last topic, which is Bronny James. Chris, I know I've been in a playoff environment now for the Cavs at Rocky Mortgage Fieldhouse, and it's officially my second season on the beat, as yesterday was my one-year anniversary at Cleveland.com. But Congrats. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. You made it. Yeah. <laughs> Somehow, <laughs> some way. Um, yeah. But I don't think I've heard it get as loud as it did tonight when Bronny walked to the scores table, not even in the game yet, to check in. And then again, when he scored his first NBA bucket, the two times I can think of that maybe, maybe challenged this were not even in the playoffs. <laughs> when Max Drews hit the more than half court heave against Dallas and when Dean yeah. Wade went nuclear Boston. against Boston. Yeah. Right. Uh, the playoffs was incredibly rowdy. Uh, the playoff series against Orlando, game seven against Orlando. It was deafening in there. Um, Fans were standing at the very beginning of that game. They were waving their towels. So I would say don't get caught up in the moment right now. Don't get um, reactionary because it's it's the most recent thing. Uh, And don't forget the way that the playoff environment was, both against um, Orlando uh, and against Boston. Probably more so Orlando because there was a feeling of like, yeah, we can win this one. Um, Game seven was really, really rowdy. And it was the the kind of crowd that you would expect for a game seven um, in the NBA playoffs. Uh, In saying that, like, it was was quite a reception for Bronny James. It really was. Um, I... (laughs) I did not expect it to be what it was, not to the level that that fans took it to. Uh, Even Bronny was surprised by it, actually. He said it was amazing, but but he was surprised by it. Because, (laughs) I mean, he didn't accomplish anything for this organization. (laughs) I I was sitting there having a conversation with somebody earlier this afternoon and they were talking to me about a tribute video. And I said, look, he's going to be part of it. They're going to be a dual one with, with him and LeBron. Because Bronny coming back is a big deal. Um, he grew up in that arena, basically. 
he used to play pickup basketball games in the attic, practice floor in the attic, while the games were going on downstairs. Um, he used to go out on the court after games and just shoot around and dribble around. So he grew up in that arena, and he was a witness to so many uh, special moments. Like, even when the Cavs won the championship, his picture is part of our gallery of photos because he was so prominent in it. Um, during the parade, he was so prominent in it. There's still this shot of LeBron James with a backwards bright yellow hat. And then there's Bronny sweating his butt off because it was a sun splash day and nobody had water. And it took forever for all of these cars to get through the parade because people piled onto the streets and they broke down the barricades and everyone was like, oh my God, this is taking like hours longer than it was supposed to. So there is a shot of LeBron celebrating uh, during the parade and right next to him is Bronny. So like he was a significant figure um, throughout the time that LeBron was here with the Cavs because that was LeBron's son and he shared those moments with him. But like I was talking to this person and I said, there's a whole other side of this. LeBron accomplished something in his career for the Cavs. Ronnie did not. He didn't score any points. He didn't have any assists. He didn't take any shots. He didn't do anything for this organization. So what are you paying tribute for? What are you honoring him for? You know what I mean? So the fact that, that somebody like that, who the biggest reason why um, it was such a big deal that, that he was participating in the game um, was because of who his father was and because of some of the things that, that Bronny did as a youngster, as a prepster um, at, at the local schools. The fact that that guy got that kind of reception was stunning to me. But it was a special moment. I'm not criticizing anybody for having that kind of reaction. It just surprised me. Um, but it was a special moment. And it was amazing to hear around the eight-minute mark of the fourth quarter, chance of we want Bronny. That is, that is not something that I had on my bingo card coming into tonight's game. I mean, the we want Bronny chants were insane. Like, yeah. throughout the end of the third quarter, into the fourth quarter, I was like, dude, what is going on? And, and sure, maybe recency bias when it comes to the, the volume uh, of the fans might be taking effect. The other part of that could be that every single play during the playoffs was loud. <laughs> and that was the one time, in, in, other than when LeBron James was announced, that the arena has gotten that loud in the last few months, right? So maybe that's what it was for me. But I mean, that was amazing. The, the, the reaction that he got just popping off the bench and strolling to the scorer's table, and then on top of that, the ov ovation that he got when, when he finally checked in into the game during the free throws, and then the way that, that people reacted when he buried that 14-foot jumper for his first points of, of his NBA career. By the way, his over-under tonight was set at 1.5. He hit the over. All he had to do was make one basket, and he did. So he hit the over. But but the reaction um, and, and the ovation that he received after getting his, his first NBA points um, and having those happen at Rocky Mortgage Fieldhouse – you know, what, 35 miles away from, from where his, his mansion is, where um, he grew up, um, about 40 minutes away from the hospital where he was born. Like, that is so cool to me. Um, as, as LeBron told me after the game when we had our conversation, you know, God works in mysterious ways. It wasn't planned that Bronny's first NBA points were going to happen um, in Cleveland at Rocky Mortgage Fieldhouse, but they did. And that just that just enhances the story even more. All right. I want to end the podcast by saying this. When Bronny James made his first NBA point, I was happy for him 
in the moment, but I felt so bad for Jalen Tyson because he's going to be on every highlight <laughs> around the country. Like the amount of video footage that has been broadcasted already of Bronny James making his first bucket on that silky little 14 foot jumper and Jalen Tyson being the butt of that joke <laughs> is going to be a forever thing, right? At Rocket Morgan Fieldhouse. And the guys in the locker room after the game were already giving Jalen crap. They, <laughs> they were already being like, it wasn't going to happen to me, but it, it, it definitely happened to you, Rook. So, <laughs> and it was so funny to me afterwards hearing the guys talk about it in the locker room. I won't go into detail, but <laughs> Jalen Tyson was not happy <laughs> about how it ended up going down. Um, obviously, understanding the moment and the things that happened to get there, but not happy that it had to happen on him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if I'm looking, I'm pulling up the story right now on ESPN. Yep, the picture, the picture on ESPN on that story is uh, Jalen Tyson trying to guard Bronny James and extending his hand and trying to contest the jumper. So, hey, at the very least, you know, he's going to be the answer to a, a, a barroom trivia question at some point in his life. It will definitely be on Jeopardy at some point. At Who some was point. guarding Bronny James <laughs> when he uh, scored his first basket in the NBA? All right. With that and with all those tidbits about what happened on the momentous night of October 30th, at Rocky Mortgage Fieldhouse when the Cavs came away with their fifth straight win of the season. That's all. That'll wrap up today's episode of the Wine and Gold Talk podcast. But remember to become a Cavs insider and interact with Chris, me, and Jimmy by subscribing to Subtext. <clears throat> we are still going to have our Hey Chris episode this week. It'll probably be tomorrow. So that means... Tomorrow's to- Halloween. I'm going to be buzzed up on candy. That's going to oh. be great. You and Elliot both. <laughs> we ain't going to get any. I'm going to eat it all. <laughs> I, I kid. I kid, people that are listening. I'm kidding. But I'm not to- going to take candy from my son. Not all of it, anyway. Some of it. But to find out what Chris is going to be for Halloween, sign up for a 14-day free trial or visit cleveland.com backslash calves and click on the blue bar at the top of the page if you don't like it that's fine all you have to do is text the word stop it's easy but we can tell you that the people who sign up stick around because this is the best way to get insider coverage on the calves from me chris and jimmy this isn't just our podcast it's your podcast and the only way to have your voice heard is through subtext y'all be safe we out